Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show about what the future could look like if we embrace the freedom to innovate. This time of social distancing has highlighted just how important social media is. Imagine a time not that long ago when being confined at home would have been an even more isolating experience. No smartphones, no video conferencing, no digital substitute for real life interactions at all. But as our reliance on these platforms has increased, so too has our awareness of just how they can surveil us, how much they know about us. Here at Building Tomorrow, we're not inherently opposed to targeted ads and other ways that social media platforms have for monetizing the data we create on and with them. But these companies do have immense potential social, economic, and political power, and they don't always use that power in the service of free minds and free markets. I can't fault anyone who feels alienated by that surveillance. But since the internet remains, for now, one of the most free and open sectors of the American economy, there aren't regulatory barriers preventing challengers to the big tech platforms from experimenting with different business models and different approaches to content moderation. One such alternative is the social media platform Minds, which has tried to strike a better balance between privacy, moderation, and decentralized authority. I'm joined by Aaron Powell, and it's our pleasure to talk to Bill Ottman, the founder and CEO of the Minds social media platform. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hey, thanks for having me. What does it mean that Minds is decentralized? Like, How much control do you have over it? So... I like to say we're decentralized with the D in parentheses. So, I mean, there's very few projects that are fully decentralized. I mean, it it, it is sort of um, impossible to be fully. There's always going to be centralization and decentralization sort of at tension with each other. But the Mm. components of our network that are decentralized are our payment system. So we use the Ethereum network for... Uh, our token system and users can uh, pay each other and subscribe to each other with with whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin or we have our own ERC20 token which runs on the Ethereum network and certain transactions can publish to the blockchain. So we have that and then we also have a decentralized governance system which is a jury system where basically if a user disagrees with a decision that we made, they can appeal it to a randomized selection of uh, 12 active users. And then those users vote on, you know, if they think that the, uh, the content in question should be, uh, um, you know, reversed. So that has been extremely successful. If you look at the content policies and some of the censorship issues on big networks, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you know, there's all this, this controversy around this. So our policy is First Amendment based. So we really try to stay as neutral as possible um, with these issues. Um, but there are always edge cases where, you know, we could make a mistake. And so th- we built this system to sort of protect ourselves from ourselves. And um, that's been awesome. People really appreciate it. And then, I mean, we are an open source project. So anyone can actually take our code and make their own version of Minds. You can launch your own app with our code. And then we're working on some federation systems so that the nodes can talk to each other. And then we're also constantly looking at new solutions for decentralized content storage. There's a really cool project we're building a prototype um, for now where which is called our weave which has built something that they call the the perma web where you can actually publish content right now it's mostly just text and images but it'll be video in the future and um it cannot be deleted so because you're you're publishing to a blockchain like distributed file system that that cannot be censored so you know we're balancing providing a user experience that is usable, which you need certain centralized functions for. So we do run central servers, um, but then we're also kind of constantly trying to push the button. So I wouldn't call us like a fully decentralized social network. That's just, that's more of our goal. How much of this is effectively a return to the way things 
used to be because we I mean, most of us today are used to this world of centralized, you know, single provider social media. Um, Twitter controls its servers, Facebook controls its servers, and we, you know, basically by their permission use their servers and their services. But you know, arguably the the largest and most successful social network is email. And that has been email's just a protocol. And anyone can write their own email server and anyone can write their own email client. And the clients can talk to the servers and the servers can talk to each other. And going back even further than the email we're used to today, we had things like, you know, Usenet, which was another just open protocol. Is that is that just kind of like what we're headed back to is I, social I totally media's protocol? Agree. Yeah. I mean, most people, granted, are not running their own email server. I mean, most people are using email now similarly to how they're using Facebook, which is, you know, like using Gmail. It, it, it's, it, you, when the internet first started, it was like, hey, you want to do email? Set up a server. <laughs> and so I think that the the challenge for the decentralization and kind of internet freedom movement in general is to make that experience of hosting your own um, server as easy as possible. But, you know, at the same time, you know, building out distributed systems like BitTorrent style systems or, you know, these sort of blockchain uh, hybrid systems, it's all about making it easy for people because what web two did was make everything so easy. You could just log into these sites and everything was done for you and it was all in the cloud. And, you know, that was a super valuable evolution of the internet. And so we want to maintain that ease of UX, but also kind of in, ingrain the freedom within it that you, that we lost with web two. And that's what web three is really trying to accomplish. How do business models fit into this? Because obviously, if you are Facebook and you control, you know, all the users have to come to your platform and use your servers, then your business model is pretty obvious. Like you can tell advertisers, hey, this is where everyone is. They can't be anywhere else, really, if they want to interact with their friends and family who are on this network. So I'm going to let you sell ads to them and it's going to show up on the platform. It's going to show up in all these ways. I control the, the client so you know exactly what it's going to look like. It's going to be uniform and so on. Uh, but as we move to decentralization or platforms, it seems like that becomes a harder thing that like, so you could imagine a scenario where mines, you know, enables other people to write clients against it. And suddenly those people are writing clients that, you know, circumvent whatever business model you have set up and now you're basically running a public service as opposed to you know something that you can you can earn a living off of so how do how do the business models work and then how is particularly because it's interesting like you you mentioned you use ethereum or um ethereum network tokens and whatnot how does crypto fit into that and does crypto kind of solve some of those business model problems yeah so in terms of the kind of competition with uh, the public, I mean, you don't even need to get into distributed systems to sort of talk about that. I mean, we can look at a company like WordPress as a, as a really important example of, I mean, because open source, for anyone who doesn't know, that just means that we share all of our software. Anyone can take our code and do whatever they want with it, um, as long as they credit us. And so... There's many companies that took WordPress's code and started competing against WordPress for website hosting. And WordPress brilliantly encouraged that. And so sort of, there's sort of this counterintuitive thing going on where, you know, the old traditional mode of thinking would say, I need to keep my secrets secrets. I don't want to tell anyone uh, the blueprints of my project, and that is what is going to give me the competitive advantage. But that's actually not what we're seeing happening now. Now you need to create network effects. And so you sort of need, I mean, it's become, there's starting to become a pressure to share your code, both for the reasons of creating network effects and for sort of public transparency. So, um, 
you know, you get the WordPress is, you know, 30% of the websites on the internet are WordPress now, and that's because they gave it away. So that's one component of it. And then in terms of, I mean, it's, I don't really think it's either or in terms of centralized systems and decentralized systems. I think that the crypto movement has a tendency to, um, I don't, maybe just over market in terms of like decentralized everything. I think it's a great goal and it's really important for people to be thinking about that, but it's, it's really, that's not even how systems work. I mean, systems, we always have centralized components of any system. I mean, if you just look at network theory, there, you're, you're not just going to ever have everything fully decentralized. That's just not how it works. There's always going to be centralized clusters of, of activity or interests in networks. So I, I, I think that it's about actually more of a healthy balance between centralization and decentralization. I mean, to, because there's so many incredibly valuable um, software systems that run on central servers that you don't need... You, we don't need to demonize centralization. We just need to hold it accountable much more and make sure that when we're interacting with centralized apps that, you know, we can see the code, that we can, you know, have a really clear understanding about, about what's going on. So mine's opened, um, I mean, I, I think 2015 is the date I've seen when, when you know, it, it launches. But it's not until a few years later that you add in the kind of Ethereum blockchain component. What changed for you as a result of that? And and was it necessary? I mean, as you pointed out, you don't actually have, I mean, clearly you don't have to have the blockchain for mines to work. What did that do? What did that add that, that you didn't have before? So we had this uh, virtual currency system prior to moving to Ethereum, like, and this was always one of our most popular features. You would earn points for all of your engagement on the network and contributions. And then one point you could exchange for one view. So we sort of gamified uh, attention a little bit and then rewarded people with more exposure for their contributions. And this was you know, very valuable to people because the algorithms on Facebook are, are really suppressing everyone's reach. You're only reaching a few percent of your own followers on Facebook because their newsfeed is such an amalgamation of, of madness. So, you know, people are struggling to get their message out. And so to have this place where, hey, you can earn views, essentially, uh, people really enjoyed that. And so that became one of our most popular features. And then once uh, blockchain and Ethereum started maturing a little bit, it's still very immature. So uh, I'll get to that. But we saw the value of, hey, we have these points on our servers. Let's take these points off of our servers and let people store their, the, the, the points on their own device. So now people can actually um, withdraw their, their, the tokens from mines into their own wallets on their own device, and they can you know, go and play with them anywhere on the internet. And so that was super valuable. Additionally, the whole token economy is much more transparent now, like in terms of the supply, in terms of the, um, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer activity. Now we do have a hybrid on-chain, off-chain system. So we do handle some of the token. To be honest, most of the token activity is still happening off-chain, um, but we encourage and actually reward people to bring it on-chain the issue is that, you know, in order to bring tokens on chain, you need to set up uh, a wallet. We use a, a, a tool, a browser extension called MetaMask, where you can pull the tokens off. And, you know, you when you use the tokens with MetaMask, you have to pay what's called a gas fee um, on the Ethereum network. In order to do a, a transaction, like say I want to send you some, some mines tokens uh, on chain, I have to pay actually a tiny bit of Ethereum in order to send that to you as opposed to off-chain where, you know, I just click a button. And so we're sort of in this position where we're trying to educate people about how to engage with the blockchain, which are, to be honest, quite slow and cumbersome and, and complicated. Granted, I think Ethereum and MetaMask are doing a great job better than anywhere else. 
but that you know it's creating a good ux in a in a very decentralized way is, is incredibly challenging and so we're just taking it one step at a time and experimenting with as many distributed systems as possible and you know over time trying to to move our infrastructure to to more distributed systems and to be honest it's even big tech understands that peer-to-peer distributed systems are valuable. I mean, Netflix uh, is closely looking at a tool called WebTorrent and other kinds of peer-to-peer bandwidth serving tools because you know ultimately, if you can offload infrastructure to the community, I mean, there's many, be- I mean, you could reduce costs. There's like more re- network resiliency. There, there's all these different benefits of, of distributed systems that I think, you know, and that's why we're seeing uh, institutional adoption of, of blockchain as well. To be clear for our listeners, the way that would function for Netflix, uh, if I'm right, is, you know, rather than everyone downloading every piece of the the TV series or movie that they're watching on Netflix uh, directly from Netflix hosted servers, they would be, you know, torrenting pieces of it from other Netflix users who have already downloaded those pieces. Um how would that apply to mines? Yeah, so we host video. Um and oh okay. yeah, so you know, for and video costs are huge uh in terms of transcoding and uh the bandwidth, it's it, videos is one of our biggest costs. So as much as we and we do use WebTorrent. So you know, that has been ex- ex- extremely helpful. So uh, I think that those are going to keep maturing and we just have to put as much energy into them as we can. So we've talked a lot about interesting technical stuff and I'm, you know, all on board with moving in these directions and I understand the technical differences and get excited by platforms that, you know, function in these ways. But for the typical user who has been using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and someone says, hey, there's this thing called Minds, why should they switch, particularly given that, you know, everyone is already on the platforms that they're using? Oh, yeah. So basically, it sort of depends when I'm talking to people, it really depends who I'm talking to, like how I position the pitch. If I'm talking to someone that I know cares about global issues, for instance, Then I might say, hey, listen, it's sort of like picking between, you know, uh, McDonald's and, you know, an an organic market. I mean, you, you know, if you care about privacy, if you care about transparency and, um, you know, these different digital rights, then, you know, I don't even say that you should leave. I just say that, you know, vote with your dollars, vote with your attention and support alternative platforms, whether it's, you know, a Firefox or Brave for the browser, you know, installing Ubuntu or Debian on your operating system, using apps like Minds. And, you know, there's other uh, distributed social networks and open source projects out there that are alternatives to the sort of mainstream proprietary stuff. I think that supplementing what you use is essential in order to growing the movement. I mean, we, we have to, the, where we, what we use every day on our phones and our computers, that use is what dictates the power structure of the internet. So tiny, even just logging in one, you know, a couple times a week, like that is super impactful. So that's one type of person. And, you know, there's millions of people who want to do that and understand that that's valuable. Now to the people who don't care about privacy and just, you know, want to do what's convenient and, you know, but they still don't necessarily love Facebook. Uh, You know, we've been focusing uh, on monetization deeply. And so, for the creator who is just sort of a, a mainstream creator who's you know not into all the ethics and whatnot, we are trying to pay people for their their energy and for their traffic. 
So, you know, on Facebook, you earn nothing on, I mean, YouTube actually has a decent program for creators, but, you know, we are trying to directly pay people in tokens and fiat. We have a, a pretty robust uh, dollar payout system for people who drive us traffic. Like we'll pay an RPM for page views that you can generate. We pay for um, all of these varieties of, of activities. So for the creator, you know, everybody's worried about demonetization on YouTube. You know, now with COVID, everyone's home. Everyone's trying to figure out how to create new revenue streams um, to be independently uh, financially sustainable. Like that to me is, is huge for us because if we can help people make money, then we can make money and we can kind of have the symbiotic relationship with our community. Then for the, the typical consumer, the typical person who's just, you know, reading away on social media, I mean, that's, that's probably the most difficult one because, you know, we, we have a couple million users, but we don't have like total critical mass where every celebrity is, is with us. And so, you know, the, the popular mainstream audience, that, that's probably the most difficult pitch, particularly people who are not creators. But, um, you know, I think that we do have like a thriving art and music community. I mean, we do have a lot of interesting content. And for this, everybody is sort of becoming a creator is the thing. I mean, now everyone's, you know, sort of a amateur photographer on Instagram or, or whatnot. And to be honest, the Instagram algorithms are coming for you. They're coming for you. I mean, everyone's seeing their likes go down on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube and, and Facebook. And, and so I think that the human nature component that what we're saying is we're not going to enact sketchy algorithms. We're always going to give you a hundred percent reach. Most people care about reaching their audience. And, and this is sort of the, the biggest crime of, you know, the big networks is, is the soft censorship that they're doing in the news feed, and this actually causes mass depression. There have been studies on this that show that you know the likes impact people's psychology. And so, when Facebook diminishes your reach and your likes, that is they know it's causing depression. And you know what we're saying is we're never going to get in between you and your audience. And I think that you know over time, as as we develop our UX and, and make it fully competitive. I, I, I think that that's a really compelling value proposition. I think people are pissed that the big networks are taking away their reach. Now, when you talk about, you know, paying creators, um, both obviously with, with tokens, but then also potentially with fiat, especially with the, you know, with the, in Ethereum, you know, transfer, you can um, cash that out potentially. But um so you you're not making money via ad revenue like uh Facebook or uh many of the other social media platforms um and yet money's going out in theory to creators where does your money come from i mean wordpress has a subscription kind of model for premium users uh how are you making money um to to keep minds up and running sure so we actually do have an ad network now, so we built the system that I mentioned before, where you earn the tokens and then you can boost your posts uh, for the tokens. It used to be one point is one view. Now one token is equal to a thousand impressions. So we have an ad network, but the difference is that our ad network doesn't spy on people in order to target the ads. So to us, ads are a neutral technology. I mean, it's a promotion tool. So you know, you can have ethical advertising systems. Unfortunately, the internet is full of spyware, which is, you know, this, these just gross ads that, you know, they follow you around. You don't know why it, it, it's sketchy. You see things that you just talked about or just walked by. So we're, we don't do that. And that causes it to be harder. It's an example of it being harder for us to make money through that revenue stream. But that, you know, so that's, a peripheral revenue stream that we'll uh, share with people. But then we do have uh, premium subscriptions. So we have Minds Plus and Minds Pro, which are sort of Minds Pro is for like full on professional creators where you can get actually your own custom domain. You can get more 
uh, customization tools, more storage, more monetization options. And Minds Plus is sort of like you don't have to see any ads or boosts and you do get some, uh, some upgrades as well. So what we're doing, I mean, you know, Facebook and Twitter, they don't offer subscription products. I mean, everyone's like, oh, how, well, how do you make money? Uh, we charge people money. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then we share that revenue with the creator. So basically, um, we take our revenue from Plus and Pro and take a percentage of that and share it with the creators who are helping us drive traffic. An issue that comes up in this, and it's it's part of the, the question of new social networks, and particularly ones that are, I guess, censorship proof, is early adopters. Um, and I think this ties into growing, growing the overall audience too, because, and I've noticed this, I noticed this on minds when I first checked it out years ago, it was, it's been an issue on other ones as well is the people who are the first to jump ship from existing social networks typically, and, and particularly the people who are attracted to social networks where they know they can't be censored, or at least are unlikely to be censored are, the kinds of people a lot of us like don't want to associate with um and and then you you end up in this this issue where if i'm a new user and i come to this new social network and i see all of the biggest people on it are alt right folks or conspiracy theorists or nazis or just other people who got banned from facebook and twitter and elsewhere i i'm going to say well maybe this isn't the place for me um but at the same time, if you're committed to a free speech ethos, you don't really have a way to limit those kinds of people. So how do how does minds and just how does this kind of decentralized social networking or or you know censorship proof social networking deal with that? You know, call them like deplorables first mover problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so our first we're we're a weird mix. Like we're not. We do have some of that, but we have more balance than you would think once you actually do kind of dig around into the content and, and you know, you can find all of these incredible, like, hyper-realist artists. And, and you know, our biggest users, you'll see people like, uh, you know, Tim Pool, or who, who's a, a journalist, a sort of centrist journalist, or, you know, you'll see some, some libertarian big YouTubers. Um, some progressives, people like Lee Camp, Abby Martin, uh, Joe Rogan. But um, you definitely do have that. I mean, look, if, if, if YouTube and Facebook are going to ban people, guess what? Where are those people going to go? They're going to go to the networks that will allow them to exist. And so, um, you know, we have... This has been a challenge for us because a lot of times those people are really good at uh, being loud and getting attention and, you know, finding their way into uh, feeds, which, you know, we're, our hands are tied to a certain degree. And so we are trying to clarify our messaging so that when people see something that they might disagree with, that, you know, it, it's, I think expectations go a really long way. And, and if you can communicate to someone why they're seeing what they're seeing, so that they don't come to the conclusion, oh, mine supports this content. It completely changes the, the interaction. So we just brought this guy on to our uh, advisory board, a hero, basically, uh, Daryl Davis, who is a de-radicalization expert. He's a black man who de-radicalized over 200 members of the KKK. Uh, he's done TED Talks and, and, and whatnot. And he literally befriends extremists. And that's how they change. I mean, people cannot de-radicalize unless they engage with people who think differently from them. So this whole theory from big tech that you know, censorship is, is diminishing hate speech is false. There's no data to actually back it up. In fact, all the data shows that censorship increases 
extremism. So we're working on some messaging where people see, uh, oh, Minds is a neutral pr platform, linking to some of this research. So, you know, you know, want to know why you might be seeing this content? This type of a heads up to people, it, it, it's, it's a tough thing because if you're going to give people recommendations, we don't want to get in the way, but we also don't want people seeing what they don't want to see. So the challenge is making people see what they want to see without censorship. And, you know, that's, that's a partially technical challenge. It's also something that we're never going to fully win. You're, there's always a chance that something's going to leak through. And so I think that that initial perception of, okay, I'm signing up here. I might see something that I disagree with. But guess what? The network is doing this for a reason. And actually, my seeing this is in a way helping de-radicalize the internet as a, as a whole because, you know, it, Minds is acting as sort of like a, a pressure release valve, you know, and other networks are sort of increasing the pressure on the internet, which can cause people to, you know, become violent. Actually, it, it's some of the research shows that the censorship directly causes violence because people think that they're some sort of a victim that it totally inflames them. They go off on, on some kind of a rampage. Now, granted it works on both sides. I mean, extremism can uh, metastasize in echo chambers as well. So, you know, it works both ways, but um, you know, overall we see the evidence showing that open networks are more healthy. And, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, you have the ability to block what you don't want to see. And we do have a pretty robust NSFW filtering system. So, you know, if, if we see things that are overtly, um, you know, if there's a racist post or whatnot, like that's going to get, that's going under an NSFW filter. And, you know, some people want to see that kind of stuff. Some people don't. We're not going to delete it from the network, but we're also going to do the best to, you know, for a new user, you know, it's, we're not going to show NSFW content by default. So um, that's one of the ways that, that we battle it. But, you know, ultimately, I think we're going to be able to drown it out uh, as, as we grow and just get more, more big influencers on and whatnot. And, you know, overall, it's, uh, it is actually a small percentage of, the content on the web but like you said because we're positioned in this way from our early stages um it does sort of pose some challenges so i, I was going to ask um uh so i i mean all this is a non-unique problem uh for minds i mean all social media networks have had to confront uh something similar i mean i i think of facebook you know early on it's a kind of uh, social network for pervy college bros to rate the attractiveness of girls. Like, I mean, so the, their early adopters, if you will, uh, were, uh, you know, uh, distasteful skeevy dudes, you know, and, um, but th they pivoted to build a, a broader audience. And, uh, you know, they also had greater centralization. So the, the pivot, the pivot was, it was easier because of that. Uh, but the point being it's, it's non-unique. Um, I do wonder though, also, you know, all social media networks have had to evolve, uh, towards greater content moderation or more formalized, I should say more formalized content moderation systems. Uh, Facebook has set up something like, a kind of like a, a, a court system, a you know, with a, it's all bench trials. Uh, if, if you will make a, if, the corollary to our legal system um, rather than a jury trial approach, which you have literally have at mind to kind of a jury of your anonymously selected peers. Um, explain, maybe walk us through what was your thought process as you developed that content moderation approach, which I'm sure it wasn't the same now, isn't the same now as it was in 2015. Um, but then also like, what does that look like on the ground? Maybe take some sort of hypothetical example what does that process look like? Sure. So, you know, Facebook rolling out their quote unquote court system, to be honest, it's, it's like a marketing ploy because at the end of the day, what matters is what is the content policy that the court system is upholding? 
So our content policy is a First Amendment based policy. We're not going to we're not smarter than you know, the constitution. So we don't think we're going to get that better. Facebook, I mean, if something even looks like uh I mean, even uh historical art with, you know, nude imagery gets banned from Facebook, which has, you know, immense value to the the general public. So they're they're just off on some ridiculous uh path of you know who knows why they they think that 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 makes sense but i mean we want to eventually move our jury system into the initial decision so right now we do have a a moderation team who you know goes through a queue of all the reports and makes an initial decision you know the vast majority of the time that no one has a problem with it and in the instances that a user feel feels like a wrong decision has been made about their content they they appeal it so you know an example it it could be anything i mean it it could be uh something that is like an insult you know it could be a nude image it could be a model it could be anything i mean it's 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 the internet is a crazy place (laughs) Yeah. There is and then oh, that, yeah. that 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 alienates someone. I mean, someone is upset with that and um, reports it. I, yeah. I take yeah, it. Yeah, we have a reporting system, and then that comes through a queue, and de- you know, depending on. And basically, if you post something, so we have this NSFW system. Like when you make an upload, and you're uploading, say you're uploading a nude model, say you're a, a, a photographer for Playboy. Um, we are that we're okay with that but when you upload it you should tag it and say that you know this is a nude image so that that image isn't getting into somebody's feed who doesn't want to see that um if you don't tag your posts appropriately then we will give strikes now even if you get three strikes for not tagging nsfw content we're not going to ban you but we're going to flag your whole channel as nsfw um, because you're just not even respecting our own tagging system that we specifically built for you. Like, guess what? We understand that you want to put your, your image in front of people who don't want to see it, but you know, that's not cool. So, you know, that's not really, um, you know, there's a whole world of people who, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I even have my NSFW on, like, I don't really, I, I don't care I, if, but most people, when they sign up, they, they don't want to just see that stuff without opting in. So um, that's how that works. And then, yeah, we have a, we have a strike system and we're, we're, we're trying to evolve it. One thing that I should, I should bring up. So this, in terms of misinformation, um, extreme content, all of that stuff, what we're working on right now is a system that uh, we call T3 for trust tree traversal. So it's sort of like a decentralized web of trust. So, you know, in China, they have a centralized social credit system where everybody based on their actions is, is getting the score. What we're doing is the, the opposite of that, but, but still take, taking a, the only thing of slight value with a, a score is that, so I have a, a group of friends and my interests are different from your interests and everyone has their own network. And so when I look at a piece of content or at a channel, I'm going to see a score on that channel, but that's not a centralized score. So say I look at your channel and someone else looks at your channel. This, your score to me is going to be different from your score to that other person based on our network. So if I'm subscribe to all kinds of PhDs and, you know, I have a good network in place, a a trustworthy network. Um, Then when I come upon certain content or channels, it is going to have a certain score, which is sort of related to my network and how they interpret that content. So if my network has all upvoted a certain piece of content, then that content is going to have a really high score for me. Now, this is really important because whether it's it's misinformation, it's like we we have a way of scoring in a peer to peer fashion. We haven't rolled this out yet, but, but we're working on this now because misinformation is a huge issue. And but we also, you know, just because something is a lie doesn't mean that or or is wrong doesn't mean it should be censored. 
but I think we do need a way of sort of deciphering uh, trustworthiness, but not in a centralized way. So I don't know if that makes sense, but th th that's a very complex problem that, that we're working really hard on right now. I did notice uh, there was like a on your website there was a ticker at the bottom, uh, which keeps a running tally of in the last thirty days how many actions were taken. And and when I checked, it was just under six thousand actions. There had been thirteen appeals of those actions and four actions overturned. I, I'm not exactly sure what I expected, uh, but the, there is a big disparity between those numbers. Is, is that normal? Uh, um, and and so so let's say we have a situation where someone posted the piece of content, someone else found it offensive, reported it, an action was taken by the moderators. Um, it then goes to appeal. What does the appeal look like? Um, how how are the, the jury members selected? Uh, and is that about the, is that a pretty normal ratio for in terms of outcomes? Yeah, I mean, if you look at that, so that, what that says is only thirteen out of six thousand actions were even appealed, meaning that our moderation team is doing a pretty good job. Um, and then of those appeals, only, so only four out of six thousand actions were you know supposed mistakes on our end, according to the jury. So how it works is we just take twelve randomized active users who are not connected directly to the person who is, is, is at hand to just kind of increase the objectivity a little bit just to make sure it's, you know, not one of their friends who's voting on them. Um, and yeah, then there's just a, you know, they have a, a prompt to either accept the appeal or reject the appeal. And we make it clear that, listen, you're not voting on, you know, your personal opinion of if you think this is good or bad. You are voting in line with our terms, which are in line with the First Amendment. And but, you know, also, you know, these are the terms for NSFW content. And so, you know, if it's a picture of a, of a nude person, then and we decided to market NSFW, then guess what? You really should be voting to market NSFW. You shouldn't be voting to overturn that yet. So there's been a lot of chatter in kind of tech policy in the tech policy space for the last couple of years about tweaking Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. You know the which shields platforms and uh, internet companies from uh, you know, civil and criminal liability for, uh, well, I mean, it shields them from, from, uh, from civil liability. I mean, they're still obviously on, on, on the, uh, a criminal, I mean, if they're, if, if they're violating uh, you know, pornography, child pornography laws or sex trafficking laws, then, then it doesn't shield them from criminal liability, but from civil liability. So there has there have been um, a wave of challenges to that kind of liability protection from four platforms like mine, like Facebook, uh, like the others. Um, there have been holes punctured in it, uh, the SESTA-FOSTA. How concerned are you about um, challenges to Section 230 and the implications for mind specifically, if we saw Section 230 liability uh, kind of completely overturned? I have a hard time believing it would be completely overturned. I mean, the issue with Google and Facebook and you know all of the, the big networks is that they are, you know, through their proprietary algorithms through their, you know, favoring of certain types of content, they are basically acting as publishers. So when, you know, they're going to favor certain, whether it's a certain political ideology or, uh, you know, whatever kinds of content, we don't know what their algorithms are actually doing. Um, but they clearly are favoring certain types of content. And I mean, that, that I, I think it's a reasonable argument that they shouldn't necessarily receive all the protections. So but but networks who are operating in a in neutral fashion, 
I, I, I don't think that that immunity is likely to be struck across the board. On the topic of censorship, and, and you've talked about this earlier, and in, in particular with the COVID-19 dis- disinformation problem on social media, and different platforms have attempted to address, you know, COVID-19 trutherism in different ways, you know, putting a disclaimer next to flagged posts, others have pulled down the counts entirely. How is Minds attempting to address disinformation in a time of viral pandemic? And do you do you see issues of reporting bias, media bias in how platforms um, are responding on their own sites? Yeah, I mean, again, they're acting as publishers. So they're taking a, a clear stance on, on certain types of content. I mean, even just covering COVID on YouTube is causing full out demonetization, if not deletion. Uh, so, you know, that's incredible that just across the board, the, they would disincentivize coverage of that. Now, um, I mean, I do think that provide, I think disclaimers are, are, are good. I, I, I think that that in, enabling the user to become educated about the full scope of the discussion around COVID, I think that that is the most important thing. So let's look at uh, all of the all of the papers, all of the different opinions, and, and and put people in a position to educate themselves. <laughs> we're we're in no position to be telling people what is the reality of COVID nineteen. I mean, we're developers and <laughs> we're mm, we're running yes. a social network. I mean, why would yeah. why would we <laughs> be telling people what is true or not with regards to that? So. Um, and I don't think that Google and Facebook uh, should be doing that either. I think that, you know, they should be providing people with the the scope of different differing opinions on it. And, you know, yeah, a lot of people have their interpretation on on what is the truth. It's not necessarily about the pandemic. It's it's about any issue. I mean, there, there's immense debate from legitimate thinkers on both sides of so many different topics. And, you know, this is when politics starts, starts bleeding into it and identity politics. And, you know, it's pretty clear, actually, what Facebook and Google think about certain topics. And I think that's, that's really scary. So, you know, again, teaching people how to research is more our prerogative than, you know, deleting certain misinformation. I think that mi- misinformation is dangerous, but probably more dangerous is the uh, unexpected consequences of just having algorithms powered by proprietary AI just blanket banning l- whole libraries of content. I mean that 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 is truly dystopian. Uh, now you're also the CIO of uh, Subverse. Um, explain what Subverse is. I mean, that seems to the decentralized future of journalism uh, should have a role, I think, in in this conversation. How how do how you as you wear those two hats at at um, at Minds and at Subverse? How do you see those two um, platforms interacting or kind of working towards a common cause? Sure. So yeah, I'm not really involved with editorial at Subverse. I'm I'm more involved sort of on the board and you know the t- and on the tech end of things but i think that what subverse is doing in terms of building a distributed team of journalists all over the world on the ground being able to get footage from all different kinds of of global events is you know super powerful and trying to kind of bring objectivity back into journalism. I mean, the way, I don't know if you've uh, watched any, any of Subverse's content, but it really is straight down the middle, like, you know, almost, almost to a certain point of being like 
two down the middle, which people, uh, some people don't like uh, because it can come off as just, you know, not having that kind of flair that everyone is thirsty for with, you know, polarized sensational media. But I think that, you know, we believe that there's a, a huge need for just footage. I mean, even just footage, we, like, so that you, you're making the decision for yourself when, when you're, when you're watching the media or, you know, but just balance coverage. And so building a uh, network with journalists all over the world, being able to submit content and yeah, again, people make their own decisions based on the content. I, I think that that's what everyone wants. And I think that we can, you can still have personality with balanced coverage, but it's just really sad, the state of the media and how, you know, nearly every news organization, you can kind of just say right off the bat what side of the aisle they're on. That, that's, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, so one of the things I've been at, to a couple of conferences and, um, you know, there's a common lament among journalists and, and not misplaced one that, uh, the old financial model that supported so much, uh, uh investigative journalism, uh, the stuff that we think of, we think of journalism as the fourth estate, the kind of higher order, less profitable, uh, forms of journalism was subsidized by uh, uh, personal ads, um, advertisements in you know your print newspapers back in the day um, w w was cross subsidized. But now that you know the internet, Craigslist, new new media has undermined that old financial model. We've seen traditional journalism um, as a you know as a as a self sustaining concern implode. The number of journalists employed has has fallen dramatically. Can subverse and this decentralized model of journalism, how does it solve that kind of funding model? Like it, journalists need to be employed. They need to be paid in order to do the work they do. Um, can something like subverse uh, replace uh, what, we, what we've been losing on the journalism scene? Uh, and uh, you know, where does subverse play in the kind of the future of decentralized um decentralized journalism. Yeah. So one key component actually uh, of both Minds and Subverse is that both are community owned. Um, so both companies did equity crowdfunding rounds. And what that means is that actually thousands of users of Minds and, and thousands of supporters of Subverse actually, well, Mines, they're now, they've been converted into actual preferred stock. Um, so Mines has 1,500 community members who own stock in the company. And this is, we use a platform called WeFunder uh, to enable this. And this was through the, job, the Jobs Act, which, you know, created a, a new type of uh, funding called regulation crowdfunding, where both accredited and non-accredited investors can can invest. It used to be, you know, for startups, you could only get accredited investors. You, you couldn't just go to like the general public. Um, and then Subverse now uh, had like around three thousand uh, supporters uh, invest, and those are under what's called a simple agreement for future equity. Uh, so upon the next funding round, those agreements will convert into stock. And, you know, so that's, that's a, a huge differentiator in terms of funding models. Um, you know, it's, it's not like some big singular VC. It is, it is the community. And then with that on top of more of the subscription model, which to be honest, some mainstream media are starting to do pretty well. Um, and you know, that is far more sustainable than what has been happening over the last decade with, you know, literally the most disgusting spyware filled news pages. I mean, you get in there and there's just like a million little ad blocks all over the place. Like it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, the, the irony is that, you know, half the time it'll be like some investigation of, of surveillance or like, you know, maybe like a piece about Edward Snowden. And it's just like the, yeah. the page is just all over you. So that I, I was just, I, I, I'm almost positive. I 
I experienced that on uh, on Vice a couple times where like the page wasn't HTTPS, there it was full of spyware and third party like commenting tools, and it was like some piece about um, you know because they have great coverage of like Snowden, but then yeah. like the, <laughs> the 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 site itself is doing the very thing that. Snowden is railing against. So, and you you know, people are doing this because they have to survive. So it's not that they even want to do it. It's that, you know, we really need to push the envelope with, with these, you know, direct to supporter models of funding. And so, yeah, that, that's what we're going for. We're not going to be reliant on, on that kind of revenue. Last question. So you mentioned that there were some initiatives, some some uh, new features you were planning on rolling out at Mines. So for the next upcoming year, what is what, what's one of those features that you're most excited about? I would say so. One thing that anyone who's listening, uh, what I recommend doing is going to minds.com slash canary, C-A-N-A-R-Y. That's sort of our experimental mode. So you can be have like the latest version of the app. We we are probably most excited for the decentralization features. I'm really excited to be able to post content more directly to distributed systems like our Weave, and we're talking to some other potential partners so that um, you know that content is is you know fully permanent. Um, I'm very excited for that. And then definitely the monetization features and this sort of radical revenue sharing that we're doing. We're basically going to be allowing creators to submit content to our premium feed and earn a revenue share on that. Sort of like a community, imagine Netflix, but like anybody could submit to it and, and in Netflix would pay out the community. Um, that's that's one thing that we're working really hard on. And then... Um, Oh, gosh, there's so much that's getting upgraded. We're, we're doing end to end. We our messenger is currently encrypted, but it's not like fully end to end. So we're rolling that out, and the messenger is going to be undergoing like a total overhaul. But yeah, just the the monetization. Just I mean, I think that people right now are all looking to be independently sustainable financially. I know for me. Personally, uh, you know, being an independent entrepreneur, like that's that changed my life. Like being able to work from home, work on my company, like there's so many people who just that's so far from their reality. And I, you know, for us to be able to provide tools so that people, you know, whether they're a musician or a journalist or, or whatever they are, to to build an audience and gain a following and, and earn money for doing what they're doing anyway on social media. I mean, that is uh, huge for us. We actually just did our first payout to our, our pro users in March. And that, you know, that, that was huge to, to finally feel like we're starting to uh, support creators. And so we have these different revenue streams that we're rolling out. So between that and then just hurtling down the path of, of decentralization and uh, you know anti-censorship, I would say those two things. Well, it sounds like you got a busy year ahead of you. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed it. Who knows whether Minds will be able to knock off the dominant social media platforms, but even if it never grows beyond its current audience numbers, it's a success simply as a proof of concept. A more decentralized Web 3.0 is possible. Monetization other than through targeted ads is possible. A democratic content moderation system is possible. Whatever platform eventually and perhaps inevitably displaces the likes of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, it will be able to learn from the example of minds. Alternately, the current incumbents, they might borrow some of these ideas for themselves, but either way, there is no great stagnation in social media. Until next time, be well. This episode of Building Tomorrow was produced by Landry Ayers for Libertarianism.org. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, check out our online encyclopedia or subscribe to one of our half dozen podcasts.